On June 22, 1876, the 7th United States Cavalry was stationed by the Yellowstone River, close to where Rosebud Creek flows into it. That afternoon, under General Custer's command, the unit departed from General Terry and headed up the Rosebud. Their mission was to quickly deal with Sitting Bull and his band of Indians. Without wagons to carry supplies, we relied on pack mules, numbering around 150. Packing and taking care of the mules fell to the soldiers themselves. We traveled up the Rosebud all day until nearly dark. The next day, the 23rd, we set out around 5 o'clock in the morning and continued until nightfall. On the morning of the 24th, we resumed our journey upstream and soon found the Indian Trail, which grew increasingly noticeable as we progressed. That afternoon, we approached the head of the Rosebud and set up camp for the night. Between midnight and one o'clock, we broke camp and resumed our march in the pitch dark. I could barely see the man in front of me, but I followed the sound of his mule's camp kettles clanking against the pack saddle. We traveled like this until dawn, then stopped to rest, sleeping for about an hour. On the morning of the 25th, we set out again. My unit, Troop B, led the advance under the command of Captain T.M. McDougall. When we were about 10 miles from the Indian camp, we halted for a half-hour rest. During this break, the officer's call was sounded. This was likely when General Custer finalized his attack plan. He took five troops under his immediate command, assigned three troops to Major Reno, three to Captain Benteen, and designated one troop, Troop B, as the rear guard. Men from each troop were assigned to take care of the pack train of mules before they left. I was one of the ten selected from my troop. Our mules were in front of the pack train since Troop B had been the advance guard. General Custer and his five troops went on ahead, followed by Major Reno and Captain Benteen. The plan seemed to be to trap the Indians between two fires. Custer led his five forces further west, while Reno crossed the river above the Indian camp and led the first attack with his three troops. The Indians, who were numerous, must have dismounted and concealed themselves in the dry ravines as there were no dead Indian ponies when we later buried Custer and his men. Returning to where we started with the pack mules, we were ahead of the train and kept moving at a brisk pace. We passed a teepee with a dead Indian inside. Soon we began to hear gunfire. We soon came across a Crow Indian approaching from the direction that General Custer had gone. He spoke little English, but when we asked him about the soldiers, he gestured with his hand saying, many soldiers down, clearly indicating that many soldiers had been killed. We next encountered a soldier from Custer's command, sent by Custer with a message for Major Reno. It seems the fight had not yet begun when he was dispatched, as he did not mention it. Soon we had a clear view of the Indian camp. Positioned on a hill, the camp looked beautiful in the green valley below. As we moved closer, we saw Major Reno and his command slowly climbing up the hill. I approached a man from G Troop named Hugh McGonagall and asked what had happened. He explained that Major Reno had retreated from the Indians, losing a significant number of men. He mentioned that Lieutenant McIntosh had been killed, Lieutenant Hodgson was missing, and the doctor had been killed just as he reached the top of the hill. The doctor was the first dead soldier I saw from the command. Meanwhile, B Troop, the rear guard, Captain Benteen and his three soldiers, and the pack train arrived. Shortly after the rear guard caught up, a lieutenant from A Troop, Charles A. Varnum, Sergeant Benjamin C. Criswell, Two other men and I were detailed to find Lieutenant Hodgson. We had descended the hill toward the river approximately halfway when we were urged to turn around by an orderly. When we got back, D Troop headed in the direction where General Custer was supposed to be. The whole command was strung out when D Troop came back at a charge gate, indicating that the officers had noticed we were being surrounded. We dismounted after traveling about 0.5 miles east. The ground was well chosen close to the edge of the hill with a good lookout toward the river on the south and east, and open country to the north and west, leaving no place for the Indians to conceal themselves. There was also a depression in the ground that provided protection for the horses and mules. Almost as soon as the troops were formed, the fight began and continued until dark. Shortly after the firing ceased, we heard taps being sounded, but it wasn't from our camp. This must have been a ruse by the Indians to make us believe Custer was camped nearby. When we later buried Custer's men, we found his chief bugler's body about a mile away from the battlefield, alone and stark naked, in a kneeling position with his back full of arrows. 
When the battle broke out early on the 26th, it was fierce and quick. The engagement continued until around noon, at which point it seemed the Indians were running low on ammunition. Our wounded men started calling for water, so about a dozen of us volunteered to fetch it from the river. We descended into the ravine, which provided cover from the Indians. However, once at the bottom, there was an open space of about 20 feet to the creek bank, which left us exposed to Indian gunfire from the opposite side. Each of us carried as many canteens as possible. Filling a canteen takes time, and standing by the bank to do so would be extremely dangerous. One of the soldiers had brought a large camp kettle, so I thought it would be safer to wade into the stream, fill the kettle with water, and then run back undercover to fill the canteens. I did this successfully. Unfortunately, a soldier named Michael P. Madden tried to fill his canteen at the creek and was shot in the leg. The following day, Dr. Plumer, Henry R. Porter, amputated his leg. As noted earlier, the only other doctor we had was dead. At approximately 4 p.m., the Indians withdrew. We didn't pursue them. That evening, we finally watered the horses and mules for the first time since the fight began. We expanded our camp and had bacon, coffee, and hardtack, the first food we'd had since the morning of the 25th. The next day, on the 27th, some of us were assigned to search Reno's battleground for the missing or dead. I went in search of Lieutenant Benjamin H. Hodgson with Sergeant Criswell and three other soldiers. His body was discovered on the riverside about 20 feet away from the water. He was nude and had been shot in the temple and groin. We found a number of dead G Troop troops nearby, including First Sergeant Edward Botzer. We laid Lieutenant Hodgson's body across our carbines and carried it back to camp. We prepared a cemetery, buried his body on the hill, and covered it with a blanket. We planted a seedling to signify the interment. We were clueless about the whereabouts of Custer and his soldiers during this entire period. We never imagined that they had all been slaughtered. Around noon, we saw a cloud of dust to the west and initially thought the Indians were coming back. We prepared to face them but soon realized it was General Terry and his command. They brought us the heartbreaking news that Custer and all his men had been killed. The next day, we went over the battlefield to bury them. It was a horrible and melancholy scene. We next proceeded to investigate the location where the Indian camp had stood. There were two teepees left standing, filled with dead Indians. As we rode past, I looked inside. They were piled up like cordwood. One of them appeared to be a Caucasian man. Although I couldn't see his face, his legs looked white. I didn't have the chance to go in and investigate further. We proceeded to skin numerous dead horses and mules cutting their hides into narrow strips and chopping down young saplings to fashion litters. By evening, we placed a mule at the front and another at the rear, loading them with litters on their backs and led by two men each. With this arrangement, we were able to move the injured, perhaps 50 in number, to the mouth of the Little Bighorn River, where the steamer Far West was waiting to take them to Fort Abraham Lincoln. We drove along the Bighorn River's banks the entire night, after splitting up the injured, we proceeded down the Bighorn River until we arrived at the Yellowstone River's mouth. Here we crossed the river by boat and camped at a place known as Fort Pease, where we replenished our supplies. From there, we traveled downstream until we reached a point opposite the Rosebud. Here, we once again crossed the Yellowstone River, received clothing and rations, and resumed our journey. On our second day of travel, we encountered General George Crook's command. Buffalo Bill, his chief scout, accompanied him on this expedition. The 7th Cavalry and General Crook's command traveled together for approximately three days until they found out that the Indians had scattered, with some fleeing into Canada. After this discovery, the two commands split up, with the 7th Cavalry heading towards the mouth of the Tongue River on the Yellowstone. We camped there for about three weeks. That concludes the Little Bighorn Expedition. About a week later, we made a brief journey down the river to Standing Rock, where we confiscated many ponies from the Indians and herded them back to Fort Lincoln.